Hello, welcome back. It's week 94 on Out on That Line. I'm Jeff with my co-host Alex. Alex, how you doing this week, buddy? Jeff, I live my life by Cobra Kai Dojo rules. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. No mercy, baby. I thought you were going to say I live my life one mile, one quarter mile at a time. Oh, no. We'll do that. <laughs> I, was, I was about to go six to midnight, buddy. When we do our teriyaki boys <laughs> retrospective, I'll do that. <laughs> oh, we could do a review of a Fast and the Furious movie album, though. The Too Fast, Too Furious soundtrack. Yeah. Back Phenomenal. when they like still gave a shit about the composition of the soundtrack. As it went on, yes. it was like, ah, incidental music. We don't really care. Yeah, who and it's not it's hardly ever even in the movie these days, you know. You get the soundtrack, it's like, yeah, these people paid to promote their song with us, so here you go. Yeah, they just want to watch Vin Diesel bone a truck, you know. That's what everyone <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they they truly are running out of places to go. I guess we can like talk about have they been down to the Marianas Trench? No, they've been to space, so yeah, the only That's way That's what I'm saying. So they went that way down. and now we got to go down. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I guess just like human car sexual intercourse is going to have to happen at some point i think you mash up the franchise with transformers and you just have optimus prime and dominic toretto just go into town on each other <laughs> set to aerosmith i don't want to close my eyes they're like facing off you think they're going to fight each other and it's this big moment you're like oh my god here we go and then all of a sudden they just start making out how do you kiss a metal man with metal lips? Vin Diesel's going to show you how, baby. <laughs> He's going to show you how. He's going to give you the business. <laughs> and I think it, that it's going to be fully soundtracked by Ludacris. Ooh. <laughs> Move, bitch. Yeah. And Pitbull. Ooh. Nice. I like that. A yeah. song specifically written for the film. <laughs> with that scene in mind. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's called Our Love Is Not Wrong. You Just Don't Understand It. <laughs> And it's going to do gangbusters on Billboard. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, can't I can't wait. wait. I, can't I hope wait. we get an advanced copy. Mm. I hope we <laughs> well, matter that much. Yeah. I heard you had something you wanted to, to start off the show with this week. Well, I want to start it with a question. Did you see the footage of Post Malone eating shit on stage? Yes. I follow him on TikTok. And so I get ancillary Post Malone videos. And yeah, I saw that. It was bad. Oh, that looked bad. Do we have any follow up on what happened to him? Uh, I th there was just a hole in the stage. It sounds like he was just shaken up kind of like, you know, after you get in a car, no major injuries, it didn't sound like. But after you get in like a car accident, you might not have like an injury, but you're just like beat up. Right. You know, and I think that might be the case there. And, and just not knowing if he was actually hurt, they just cut the show off. Uh, but I guess he said he's going back and he's going to do like a full two hour show. I forget what city was it. L.A.? No, I don't remember. No, that was, L.A. was where the weekend lost his voice. We never mentioned that either. Um, but yeah, I saw the I saw the footage and I was like almost going to laugh at it. And then he didn't get up. And I was like, oh, no, he did the Peter Griffin. Just ah, <laughs> he had the fucking wind knocked out of him. Poor guy. Like there's a there's a epidemic of that. Luke Combs was up in Bangor. I was up visited Maswadi mm -hmm. and a bunch of her friends went to see Luke Combs and Bangor. He got like two songs in and was like, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to shit my pants and puke at the same time. I feel terrible. I can't do this in good conscience. I know you guys got babysitters and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So full refunds for everybody. Sorry to disappoint you. And didn't he play the rest of that show too? Anyway, he just like had them all sing the songs. I think he did for a little while. And then it was like, I ah, was too much. I'm going to die. Yeah. I need to go home. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I heard the crowd when, when he played in Seattle and we were at this apartment for an engagement party, like that was like right next to, I think he played at the Seattle Sounders field. Um, but we were on this balcony, like right near that. So we couldn't really like hear the music that well. It was very distorted, but you could hear the crowd yeah. and they were going bananas for that guy. Hey, the people love their Luke Holmes. Yeah. You know, um, so my question with the Post Malone thing, the reason I ask this is, it's, I get mm -hmm. that it's no fault of his own, but I did it did get me thinking. In the long history of seeing concerts, what is the worst you've ever seen a performer eat their balls? Just really like technical difficulties or just performance mm -hmm. difficulties? What's the worst you've ever seen? Um. Oh, man. I feel like a lot of the concerts, thankfully, I kind of, only really remember the good ones 
but I've seen a lot of like local bands and I've honestly played a lot of concerts <laughs> <laughs> that were not very good, you know, I'm full disclosure here. Um, uh, but I do. Oh, you know what? There was one concert and I wasn't actually there for this one. I was, I was thankfully just had to be absent, but there was a concert and Tanner recounted this story for me. And it's about Matt Reno. Oh, <laughs> And they were playing a song, and I can't remember what song, but it's not the it's not the important part of the story. But the song involved possibly, I guess, a saxophone. And so Matt Reno fancies himself a saxophone player. So they're playing the song. He doesn't have the saxophone out. It's still packed away. And they're playing the song, playing the song. And eventually Reno decides, guys, keep going. I'm going to do a saxophone solo. <laughs> and goes back to to put this thing together. And just like can't get it figured out. And you know with the saxophone, it's got that reed, that like wooden piece oh, that yeah. goes on the mouthpiece. Yeah, you gotta like get that wet and like you can't just go in there go in there dry, you know? You gotta warm up that oven before you stick in the turkey, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can't Shapiro this. <laughs> yeah. And he decides in the middle of the song that they're just gonna keep playing, jamming out, you know, just improvising. I love fish. You know, it's Vermont, why not? And then I guess he gets finally gets it together, but the saxophone just doesn't sound very good. And whether that was through Reno's fault or just it was a bad saxophone, I don't know. But I every time I hear this story and the way that Tanner can tell a story, I wish that I was there for that. But I'm also glad that I wasn't. Because here's the thing. Matt Reno, God love you if you're listening. But I guarantee <laughs> that saxophone was a saxophone he forgot to return to Ellis Music in the seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet the reeds that he was using were the same reeds he got when he yeah. got the kit. So not even did he not soak them. They were probably older than fucking Cloris Leachman. God rest <laughs> her soul. You can't be doing As a former sax man myself, I got to tell you, the margin of error is tiny. You cannot <laughs> I feel like to that's a up. difficult. That's a difficult instrument to not. Like keep up with and hope that you play well. She's a relentless mistress. If you don't treat the saxophone <laughs> with respect, she will stop treating you with respect. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna have to get Tanner on sometime to recount some stories about playing in Hair of the Dog because I'm that. sure he remembers a lot of it a lot better than any of the rest of us that were there. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, at your bachelor party, most of the pieces of Hair of the Dog are going to be assembled, so. If That's we can true. Cobble together an oral history for the people, a little omnibus. That's true. That's true. We could we could very well do that. Oh, I don't know. The ozone, they, I just read an article that the ozone layer is repairing itself. I don't know if we want to you know, test things by doing that. Well, it's fair. You quite know, so soon. It's all about coulda, not shoulda. <laughs> well, what about you? What's the worst thing you've seen happen at a concert? Oh, I think I've told this one before, but for my birthday in 2019, I uh, Tanner and I went to see Elvis Costello. My first time mm -hmm. seeing him. We were so goosed up. We we're so excited. And we got in there and he just kept playing songs that he rarely plays on tour and just like stuff that we love. In a room full of like 50 and 60 year old people who are like quietly and politely enjoying Elvis Costello from the gallery tanner and i it's like we were at miss the misfits concert we're just like no fucking way no fucking way dude we're shaking each other we're like writhing in our seats we're making a real spectacle of ourselves as we do and he gets to the song if you know elvis costello it's off trust which we did shot with mm -hmm. his own gun Yep. And it's this very tender, just like Elvis Costello and the piano. And they bring him out this old timey microphone so that he can really get in there and give it to us and really like hit the nuances of that song. And it starts and he was flatter than four o'clock, flatter oh, no. than a plate of piss the whole time, the whole time. He had a moment. He's Elvis Costello. He can stop and go. Oh, I think we screw. I don't think we're in the same key, mate. Oh, can you give me my starting note? Ha ha ha! Live music, everybody. He has that grace. He's Elvis Costello. Yeah. But God love him. He forged ahead, and he was <laughs> flatter than a plate of piss the entire song. Oh God! Digging my fingernails into the the only time I was still during that concert was white knuckling it through shot with his own gun. It was horrendous. It, I've heard cats fuck with better harmony than that. Oh, man. Well, you know, Elvis Costello is known for being 
phenomenal vocalist, so I can see why you were disappointed. <laughs> hey, for the kind of people that like that kind of thing, it's the kind of thing they like. <laughs> I I've heard similar things about a lot of a lot of artists. The weekend just lost his voice. I guess Motley Crue. I mean, not that Vince Neil was ever a great singer, but I guess it sounds like a frog trying to throw up at this point. Nice. You know, there's a lot of guys that eventually they just fall off that cliff. It's unfortunate, you know, but but what can what can you do? Hey, really? the hell are you gonna do? Yeah, right. You just gotta just load up on that honey, give it one more good old college try, and and sail off into the sunset. I think. Green apples, baby. That's the key. <laughs> pH balance and a green apple. It'll keep you going. <laughs> well, speaking of somebody with some legacy, we've got an album this week that was suggested to us. I don't remember who suggested this one, so you might be able to enlighten us just to give them credit. Uh, but it's going to be the Mountain Goats new album, Bleed Out. Yes. This was submitted by my roommate from college, Paige. Shout out. Okay. To, shout out to Dirt Dirt. What's going on, girl? <laughs> um, she has seen the that the rocket is leaving the station here because the channel keeps growing by leaps and bounds. Oh, yes. So she was like, hey, remember how we used to listen to the Mountain Goats in college? Why don't you check out the new Mountain Goats? And I said, well, I sure will. And here we are. And here we are. Uh, you know what? I Hand up. Full disclosure. I don't think I'd ever heard the Mountain Goats before. Really? Like, of all the bands and of all the people that you think would have listened to the Mountain Goats, I don't think I ever have. You never heard No Children? I'm not sure. I mean, it might be, like, incidentally, and I just didn't know, because I've heard a lot of music that sounds, you know, that has similar sounds to this, like, you know, Wilco and and bands like that. You know, it's it just, not that I, like, avoided listening to it, and in fact, I kind of regret not having listened to more before after listening to this album but yeah i'd never i don't think i'd ever listened to mountain goats before interesting and you would definitely know because john darnell has like such a distinctive mm -hmm. voice um so yeah wow that's interesting i i mean they're not right? they're not like you know a, a household name right no it's pretty I think just much... the longevity though i mean because they've been around for a long time i was talking about legacy like when did their first album come out when did he do it um, I mean, he was making lo-fi shit in his bedroom starting as early as, like, 91, but I want to say, like, the career kicked off in earnest in, like, 97. Yeah, okay, 25 years ago. Yeah, and they, yeah. It, I say they, it really is John Darnell's thing and then, like, yeah. adding in other musicians, but we'll say they. Um, but they've been putting out an album almost every year, and, like, if they, the most they took off was, like, two years. Sometimes they'll do two albums in a year. They're, like, fucking King Gizzard. Yeah. They're just constantly yeah. putting new shit out. That's who I kept seeing when I was looking them up. That's who I kept hearing them get compared to. Not musically necessarily, but just like how prolific they are at, at releasing stuff. There's just a mountain of things to go back to if you've never listened to the Mountain Goats before. That's funny, a mountain, Jeff. You know who else released a <laughs> oh, mountain you. of music? Frank Zappa. That's true. I mean, there's there's a lot of hidden gems. Right? Look at all these parallels yeah. we're drawing here. This episode's off too well. <laughs> we, yeah, oh, we got a lot of hashtags we got to throw on this one. Yeah, goddamn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so right off the top, I want to ask you, as the guy who'd never listened to a lot of Mountain Goats, what did you think? So I heard a lot of influences of a lot of things that I liked in this. Like, I enjoyed this because this is right up my alley. This, like, indie rock. Um, usually, you know, a lot of times I skew more more aggressive but like back in the day i loved hootie and the blowfish and bare naked ladies and that kind of like you know they were rock and roll they were upbeat and i get a lot of you know that sort of feel from this but i also heard like rem yeah in oh, this yeah. one as well i mean a ton of influence from them and especially on one of the songs that i'm gonna be going over as one of my picks and it's i enjoyed all the way through because there was a lot of humor in it, a lot of like self-deprecation, you know, just a lot of a perspective that I appreciated. It was almost like a very kind of Kurt Vonnegut type of, you know, it's just like it, it, you can't do anything else but laugh because it hurts so much to, to realize what he's saying. You know what I mean? Uh, but overall, yeah, I just, I can see why he's been able to make a career of this project for, you know, 25, 30 years now at this point and is like a legend you know, and, and I fully understand, like, I knew who the Mountain Goats were, but I don't think I could have ever told you what song they ever sang or like, and this did not sound anything like I thought they would 
Like I thought it was going to be a lot more of like a folk band type of thing. And yeah, it's not at all. I think um I think the use of acoustic guitars and the lo-fi origins and John Darnielle's voice are what kind of give the impression that it's going to be a lot folkier than it is. Like it's folky, mm-hmm. but it's not like hardcore, full on, yeah. full penetration folk. Um, I love the fact that they're always playing with concepts. They're they're the closest thing in music to a filmmaker since Warren Zevon. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Warren Zevon wrote um, "Accidentally Like a Martyr," and he's like, "It's a Scorf- Scorsese film as a song." And you're mm-hmm. like, damn, you listen to it and you're like, fuck, it really is. And that's kind of the same talent that John Darnielle has. Like they did an album, uh, Beat the Champ, which is all wrestling themed. And there's songs mm-hmm. about like Bruiser Brody and Chavo Guerrero. Um, Goths was one about like the aging California goth and like what's left for you when you kind of age out of that aesthetic. What's your identity? Mm-hmm. So John Darnielle kind of gets really wrapped up in a concept or an archetype and runs with it and it's not necessarily like full-on concept album the who's tommy joe's garage nothing Mm -hmm. you know it's not necessarily like a story so much as it is vignettes based around a theme that's very much what's going on here sort of like um what was the album was it bowling for soup that we did was it like uh dear interstate messenger or something Uh, like that welcome interstate managers fountains of wayne Fountains of Wayne. I was so close. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did that on the Instagram. I put a picture of Bowling for Soup. I'm like, are you guys ready for this week's episode with Fountains of Wayne? You're so excited. You didn't even realize this is a picture of Bowling for Soup. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to blame it on that. Not that I had no idea which, which yeah. band it was. <laughs> yeah, blame it on the boogie. But baby. it's I got now that that just like light bulb moment for me, just very similar feel right. to that album we did. Because that was like a concept album, but it was a bunch of little pieces of a bigger story. Yeah, slices of Americana. Yes. And this one is, during quarantine, John Darnielle just, like, hammered a bunch of action films from, like, the 60s through the 80s, early 90s, and found that, like, black and white sense of morality in those movies to be really interesting Mm -hmm. and just kind of built out all of these familiar scenarios. The hostage crisis, the car chase, the training montage, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. Um just kind of played upon the archetypes, the scenarios. Um, For me, didn't really get into a sound necessarily that evoked the stuff that inspired him, Mm -hmm. but that's pretty bog standard for the mountain goats because they, they're not about like radically altering the sound. Although the sound was different on this one, which we'll get into, but not in the direction of the material that inspired it, which I promise will make sense as we get started. Yeah, this, so we'll get, let's get right into it. So the first song on the album is my first pick. It's called Training Montage. So first of all, like, I love 80s and 90s, like, action movies. Like, I I just love that era of movies. Like, Patrick Swayze movies, Tom Cruise movies, just fucking love them. And this song felt like exactly what he was trying to portray here is like a montage song. And the lyrics that he was singing... It was like in Team America World Police. We're going to need a montage. Like it, It's like they're just describing it perfectly. But every part of this was describing... I could think of a movie that I love that what he's singing about is like... Maybe not that movie, but like there's something that I can relate to it. You know, and it's just like such a clever way to have a song and such an entry into an album. Because a montage is to pass the time. It's to like develop some story for you real quick and then get to the meat of things. And I feel like that's exactly what he does with the first song on the album here. It's so fucking smart. It's great. And like even one of the lines, it feels like it takes forever. It's maybe five minutes on screen. And even the song Mm -hmm. is like montage length. Yes. Um, So just clever. And this one for me is, I think I brought up this concept on the show before, but the promise of the premise So if you're going to make a concept album based around action films and action archetypes and stereotypes, you kind of got to start off giving us that. And this is quintessentially Mountain Goats until I'm doing this for revenge and then it kicks in. I've never heard this much electric guitar get used in the Mountain Goats before. This is a brand new facet for them. I'm not going to sit here and claim to be the number one Mountain Goats expert, super fan. There's just Mm -hmm. such a huge volume of material. But 
I've never heard them sound like this. And I thought that paradigm shift in the sound and the subject matter, I'm like, okay, this is the promise of the premise that to me yes. didn't really get followed up on successfully at all times. But in terms of this getting out of the gate, perfect. Yes, it was it was definitely a hot start. Those engines were burning hot. But the verse, the last verse into the chorus, everybody ready for justice, just another mile to go. But the strings will keen and the horns will cry when it's just me against the sky. And it just paints such a picture. But that, the chorus, I'm doing this for revenge. And you don't realize it. You think this is going to be all cheesy, but then it gets a little bit real there. You know, it's like, who are you getting revenge against? Like, that's where you get interested in the story. And I really like the way that it just opens it up. It's a great album opener. You know, it was just fantastic. I went back and listened to it immediately again after and I knew from the first time I listened through this one that this was going to be one of my picks. Yeah. This was one where it was like, well, they all could have been picks. Um, there were only a few clunkers in my mind. Um, and we, you know, didn't really hit any of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And the thing that I like, too, is like there are a lot of allusions to uh, action hero, like well-known action heroes. And we'll mm-hmm. get to that as well. But I like to picture at least at bare minimum this song with John Darnell as the action hero because he's this scrawny fucking buggy whipped arm nerd and mm-hmm. i just see him with his coke bottle glasses and his white wife beater just hanging off of his body just like training with his fist tape i'm doing this for revenge and he's just like <laughs> attacking a slab of beef with a samurai sword or something <laughs> it's again it's like it's not a silly song but you kind of take away from it Whatever you like, like he sets up a specific yeah. parameter and then like you build the movie in your head. I got very like hot rod yeah. montage vibes <laughs> yeah. in this one or like Patrick Swayze and Roadhouse like doing the Tai Chi vibes like I got it was just so incredible. Just so it was awesome. Up. Yeah, just just every bit of like that cheesiness from that era of movies that I love was in that song. So good. Uh, but then we move on to and we were we kind of like front loaded this album with our picks because mm-hmm. I feel like they really they got off to a hot start. So my next pick was the song Mark on You. And after training montage, which was a very like lighthearted sort of like entry into this album, just kind of being like, hey, here's what we're going to do, folks. Welcome in. Let's have some fun. You get into Mark on You and immediately. It's just like, well, this has got a little creepy. You know, this got a little bit, you know, it's just you gave you it's kind of I feel like jumping to different emotions to like display to you what you're supposed to be seeing throughout this like storyline that they're going to be telling us is kind of the feeling that I got going into this one. I mean, just the the idea of I'm going to leave a mark on you is like it's it's a very it's a very dark thing the way that he says it. Mm. I um and then. To me, like we said, these aren't all necessarily connected, but it does follow a through line from training montage to this because training montage is preparing yourself, body and mind, to undertake your vengeance. Mark on you is you actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And so there is, there's that kind of shift in the heaviness and the darkness. Like it's exciting to think about like that vengeance is fueling you. Now you actually like the bill comes due. You actually have to do it. Mm -hmm. And that will take a toll on you ultimately. So mark on you, but you know, mark on your, you know, prey here, but it's also Mm -hmm. a mark on you, a literal mark on you. Like you will be changed doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, I like those clever little subtle things that don't, that's a great strength of the mountain goats is a lot of things are more straightforward on this album compared to other material where there's kind of a double edged empathy. Like you, nothing's as black and white as it is on this album Mm -hmm. because action movies are black and white heroes and villains. Um, So it's an interesting paradigm shift as someone who was, you know, vaguely familiar with the mountain Mm -hmm. goats. Um, And then like musically for me, like the pacing was interesting on this one. Um, It almost at times felt like a demo that got leaked, not Mm -hmm. like incomplete, but, it, it felt a little like 98% ready. And I, I don't mean that as a, a diss. It was just like an interesting compositional choice to make it feel like slightly hasty. But I think that kind of works for the theme of vengeance. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, I think 
I th- I can I can understand what you're saying because I think the like we kind of pick things in in pretty sequential order to start off, and then I think the clunkers got sprinkled in those spots where it kind of jolts you out of it, which is I think those few spots are are really the only thing holding this album back for me from being like great, mm-hmm. you know, from being like when I'm going to run out and tell people they need to listen to. Um, it's just the, I think you're right with the pacing. I appreciate the first few, how they move, but it's after that. And we're, and I think we can talk about that after we get through your next, your first pick um, and kind of how it, from that point on, it doesn't really move the way that it did at the beginning. And I think w- when you're, when you look at this song and you compare it to those spots, you know, you look at training montage into, into Mark on you, and you compare it to some of those other transitions we get, you know, kind of in the middle and later part of the album, you can see why this one got a little bit of a mixed reaction. Yeah. Um. So to kind of support that and move into my first pick, which is mm-hmm. Wage Wars, Get Rich, Die Handsome. I organized my picks. I, I picked three very different things. This one is a fantastic example of how cinematic this album is and it really embodies the the scenario that's being reached for here and it's a fantastic example of the new mountain goats sound that's being used on this album my other two picks one of them is this is a great example of quintessential mountain goats and the other one is this is the closest the sound came to matching the subject matter and the theme But at any rate, Wage Wars, Get Rich, Die Handsome, Mm -hmm. for me, was such a huge infusion of energy. This is going to be the one that people are screaming along to at shows. This one's going to be the anthem. Oh, yeah. Um, It's a car chase song. It's paced as such. You've got these punk drums and this fat bass that just keep the whole thing motivated, even when it's like this feeling at the beginning where maybe the car is like stopped at a stoplight. And then the first lyrics are literally floor the pedal at the green light, watch Mm -hmm. the traffic all drift, right? Barrel forward, unimpeded switch lanes as needed. Be flexible, be unreplaceable in a world of heavy footprints, be untraceable. Like you can just see the fucking French connection in this, Mm -hmm. like hell bent for leather. It jacks your shit up, man. Yeah. It's, it's so descriptive. And I feel like that's what I loved about training montage. And he does it just as well. In this song, it's like that that very visceral feeling you get because of all these movies that you've watched. Like it's just he's speaking exactly like directly to my heart with the movies that I love the most in the world. Like this is describing so many scenes from those movies perfectly. Uh, it's and again, like yeah, it, it it does. It's got like I got a lot of Taxi Driver in this one, almost like French Connection, Taxi Driver in terms of like the tapestry like the image that is Mm -hmm. created with the lyrics and then supported by nothing in taxi driver is as exciting as the way that this song sounds but you get that kind of like grimy seedy city life feeling and then just right out of the gate there's Mm -hmm. this excellent chase sequence you see it in your mind's eye and to me this was probably the perfect compromise between or the perfect halfway point between the change in the sound and then like the concept of Mm -hmm. the album. But this is still more than like kind of a saxophony 1960s, 1970s chase sequence. This is like punk mountain goats, which is not something I ever really thought I'd get in full force. Just that wage wars, get rich, die Mm -hmm. handsome. Like people are going to go right off for this. Yes. Concerts. And I think there, I think they probably can't wait to play this one at concerts i mean i i don't know the rest of their catalog they probably have a ton of bangers you know that people love to hear at concerts but i this if they don't play this one live then i hope it means they've got a set list that's already stacked yeah you're you're fools if you don't play this one live guys yeah. what the hell yeah you gotta let it rip see this one i think you know i like to think he wrote it from the pov of dom toretto oh quarter yeah. he wrote this song a quarter mile at a time yes yeah, it's that good. That's what, that's the only reason it made me think of that. I was like, there's only one other thing that gave me this good of a feeling, and it was each time that I saw the Fast and the Furious movie in theaters. Yeah, you never forget your first time seeing a Fast <laughs> and Furious movie. <laughs> no, you don't. 
<laughs> uh, but this was one that was going to be one of my picks. So I'm glad that you picked it because it gave me a chance to get you know, a different one. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add about Wage Wars? No. Get can, rich, die handsome? We can slip on. Okay. Um, so my last pick is the song First Blood with obvious references to Rambo, the first movie. This was the song when I was talking about that R.E.M. influence before. This was the song that I really heard that that influence and specifically the man on the moon. Mm. Like I just mm. for whatever reason, just his tone of voice, very similar in my mind, in, at least in this song to Michael Stipe, the way the chord changes happen, just like the tone of the instruments. It just like gave me very R.E.M. vibes and I fucking loved it. And this was, uh, you're absolutely right. Like, the more you talk about it, the more the REM vibes crystallize for me. And I'm like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Because it's totally true. Um, and there are also these, like, certain vocal inflections that John Darnell does where I, like, they might be Giants kind of goofy music, but that same kind of thing with the voice. Mm -hmm. um, you just hear these, like, very interesting twangs, which give a whole new context to these songs as opposed to like if you got like the lead singer for the national god help us <laughs> to, to do this can you imagine what a fucking funeral dirge a song like this would be <laughs> oh god like the voice lightens things up you know i like a unique voice and this kind of like lightens mm -hmm. it up a little bit especially because this is the most hopeless song on the album and it is a rare um breaking of kayfabe like the the rest of the songs on the album are portraying these characters as characters. It's not mm -hmm. like peeking behind the curtain, but in First Blood, it's deconstructing characters like John Rambo and and looking at like the motivation behind them. It's taking like an arm's length distance from these characters and and jumping out to make a, a comment which is like, no Rambo is coming. The lone lawman taking matters into his own hands is a myth. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting turn for an album that like is resistant to break character and presents the subject matter in a real and straightforward way. And like, it's taking something like, well, people will tell you there's no atheists in foxholes, but in reality, anyone in a foxhole doesn't believe in anything because this is the end. It's like a very bleak turn on an otherwise yes. like very fun album. Yes. And I like, I kind of, you go through, you know, our first picks training montage, you know, Mark on you and, wage wars get rich die handsome and it's like those songs are bursting through a fence in a camaro with a with an eagle on the hood and the whole thing's on fire you know what i mean like that's how those songs are come out of the gate and mm. this one that car is starting to fall apart you know you're starting to realize like oh you can't really live life that way you know you can't really you know hope that you're gonna be the number one hero you know what I mean? Like Rambo was just a movie, you know, like that's the sentiment that they're giving you. And the line where they say we worship nothing in the foxholes, John Rambo never went to Vietnam. You know, it's just like what a exactly like you said, it's just bleak. You know, what a what a dark way to look at things. You know, there's no hero that can save you from this miserable thing that you're going through. And uh, yeah, and especially with like the album like the placement on the album it's like this weird kind of like again breaking character and being like you know that everything else on this album is just like to be taken in good fun it's not real it's not based on anything mm -hmm. real don't take any kind of life lesson from this because in the real world you know if the bad guys got the kind of forces that we're talking about in these movies one guy no matter how well trained ain't gonna make a goddamn lick of difference yeah so just keep that in mind as we continue to have fun. It's like it was an interesting little like mm -hmm. pep talk in the middle of the album. Yeah, it was just a very I don't know. It's one of those movies like when you see those movies that just let you through. The, see, you know, they kind of look through that fourth wall once in a while and be like, hey, take mm -hmm. a peek at this. This is how what it's really like that. I felt like they were just kind of like giving us a little a little break in the curtain to see what's going on behind the scenes. And I, and I really appreciate that in the album. Cause they're like, don't get too involved in, in all these hero stories. Just remember this is actually real life. And that sort of stuff doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. 
Interesting. Interesting. I'm I'm glad you picked that one. I almost did. So I'm glad yeah, you did. That was that was a fun one. And and really I picked it mostly because of that REM sound. Because like mm-hmm. I love REM and that just it was like I could tell that he does too. It was yeah. nice to it was nice to hear. Um but the next pick and this one, hold on. I, I was confused on which okay, so guys on every corner is first on the on the album. So this is one of your picks. Yes, I gave them to you out of order. I apologize. Um so this one is another classic action movie trope it's a sting slash stakeout it's a very paranoid song you'll never find my clever operatives hiding in plain sight oh look over there it's a donut vendor doesn't he look nice what a what a homely old man well guess what he's part of my network of spies motherfucker so it's like a fun like the paranoia thrillers of the Mm seventies. Like it's got that flavor. And this was my pick that to me really delivered on the promise of the premise. I compare it to, I know you weren't crazy about tranquility base hotel and casino, um, Arctic monkeys, but Alex Turner wrote that he had insane writer's block. And then he watched eight and a half by Federico Fellini. And he was like, there's my album. Mm -hmm. And he went off and made, uh, Tranquility Base, and I listened to that, and I'm like, it is. It's a Fellini movie. Like he made mm-hmm. it sound like a Fellini movie looks and feels, and it's like I I love when the promise of the premise is followed mm-hmm. up on. And in this song, this is the closest to me that we get. Uh, Bones don't rust, which is a pick we didn't do. Kind of close. I waffled on which one because mm-hmm. I might like Bones don't rust better, but guys on every corner. That's sax time, baby. That's sax time. It just flashes oh, yeah. this thing out and gives it that sinister sound. Yes. Mm. It, it. This gave me, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to describe this well enough, but like the 80s and 90s, they would have, you know, the sets they would have of like the cities. The streets were always like very narrow in those because they had to kind of condense everything. And there was always just like a fruit stand. Like an honest, like just a stand on the sidewalk that just had fruit in it that would always get hit by whatever car chase was going on. And it was just like, you can tell it looks real enough for the movie, but it's just like clearly not what real life is actually like. You know, it's like, like New York is like, they're like four lanes wide every street there. Like there's no way to get that good on the camera, but that's what I got the vibe from here. It's like this very kind of like condensed scene. It's like dark. There's one like obvious street light, but you know, it's a spotlight just off camera. That's doing it. It's just like almost a play but on screen, you know, and, it, and it's just like, that's, I felt like they did such a good job in so many points of this album of making you feel like you were somewhere. Yeah. And it's seedy. It's sleazy. Again, yes. I invoke taxi driver. Like it feels like the beginning of taxi driver. The streets are just like wet and shining under the street lights, mm-hmm. And there's just like steam coming out of the sewer grates. It's just like, Everything looks like it's coated, intentionally coated in grime. And this just had that sound that put me in the headspace of all of these films that inspired this album. So for me, this was a real winner in terms of of getting that concept across. Mm -hmm. And it was all, you know, it's just there was all sorts of cleverness throughout this album, just the way... I don't know. I think, again, I always talk about how this is the difference between somebody that's been doing this as a career for 25, 30 years and me is they can take these ideas and put them into song and keep it interesting enough that other people want to hear it. You know, and, and I and I appreciate that because if people if there were more people like me in the world it'd be a pretty boring place, we get some excitement because there's people with brains like this that can come up with these scenes that are so like specifically derived from things that you can't put your finger quite like on specifically, but that you're so familiar with. And I feel like that's such a deft little songwriting trick that he does. Yeah. To, to, again, we love to talk about invoke a, uh, an image with a sound. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a singular talent. And I just appreciate the things that John Dare Neal gets obsessed with. Because, I mean, who writes a whole album about professional wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. Who writes an album like this? And it's not goofy, ha-ha, can't take it seriously, Frank Zappa kind of stuff either. We're 
we got a Zappa hat trick this episode. I got him. For times. sure did. You um, earned every one of them too. Damn. Seamless, baby. <laughs> seamless. But it 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 takes the concept seriously without being self serious. There's actual talent shining through. It just tick 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 checks all the boxes. And a song mm-hmm. like Guys on Every Corner, to me, like really distills that down to its essence. Mm-hmm. And we have one more to go through. It's going to be your last pick, and this is the song Hostages. Very clever chorus in this one. Yes. Um. The problem is, I hate to end on a down. Oh note. no. Um, but I thought this was kind of a, a sloppier pick mm-hmm. because for me, it was very far from the new sound. It was very far from the conceptual sound and it does not represent the best work of the mountain goats. It kind of felt like these three elements were all kind of working against each other, kind of mm-hmm. choking each other out. And there felt like there was some kind of like off pacing and some weird indecision, like too much time between phrases. Um, it moved a little too languid for the, it's a seven minute song. Yes. And it doesn't have the kind of tension built up that you would think a song about a hostage situation would have. So I, I hate that it's the last pick and I hate that I didn't instead highlight something I liked, but this was very interesting to me in its flaws. Like I'm not going to sit here and castigate again, artists who make something that I enjoy that flavors existence Mm -hmm. and and is art. I'm not sitting here being like, I would have done it better. But again, sometimes I love stuff because it's fuel for a conversation Mm -hmm. and it's food for thought. And that's what this one was because it wasn't entirely successful. Yeah. And I also don't know, you know, the, the reason for the conversation about it is, I agree with you. It's not very successful. And I think what they were trying to do was spark a conversation about politics because this is like the political song on the album. I mean, they're talking, they're, they're not like naming, you know, saying Republicans and Democrats specifically, but she like, where is it here? Um, There's disagreements on procedure, vocal, bitter divisions, as is often the case in situations like this one. Um, you know, it's just like, there's a lot of stuff just saying, oh, the world today, the way it is, nobody agrees on anything. We can't get anything done. There's no good left in the world. You know, a lot of stuff that we're, that we're used to hearing, but it doesn't, I feel like you don't have to provide me solutions, but provide, provide me with a more interesting perspective than just like raising your fist at the sky and telling me these things exist and that they make you angry. You know, and it's just like, I feel like that's the thing I get from this one. And it doesn't, doesn't give me those like clever perspectives and like an interesting way to look at things the way that other songs on the album did well and if you're going to take seven minutes to talk about something that is as rich for discussion as a hostage situation like maximize your minutes Mm -hmm. like witnessing a hostage situation like how wrapped with attention the world is when you see like a high-speed chase or something like that Mm -hmm. so a hostage situation to someone with no stakes in it fascinating uh, it is a matter of life and death to the people involved in it, to the negotiators, to the hostage takers, and to the hostages. It is an incredibly bad idea for the perpetrator because it will never end well. Yeah. And the leverage in this is human life. It's a grim stalemate. And there's a job to do, but it's treated like a job. There, It's kind of dispassionate. Like, mm-hmm. we may run out of bullets, but we'll never run out of hostages. So even when the weapons are gone... We've got the leverage because we've got human beings. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting idea that over the course of seven minutes, like you said, it's a lot of like, oh, you fist shaking, but mm-hmm. no solutions, no real introspection about it. And even so, the lyricism is like the mountain goats. John Darnell has a, a real sense for when to turn a phrase and how to turn a phrase. So it's not like it's totally lacking in execution, but it is kind of lacking in imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's the, the most succinct way to put what's wrong with this song. You know, it's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't grab me. I enjoyed that. The line, you know, we may run out of bullets. We're never going to run out of hostages. I enjoyed that line because I was like, ah, that's kind of funny. You know, that's definitely like a movie line. Yeah. But they could have given what they did with training montage and first blood, you know, and these songs that like have these very specific kind of funny ways of looking at things. And then you have this where it's just like so literal. It just felt out of place. 
Like it just felt like one of those kind of bumps in the road. Like I could probably could have gone back to the drawing board on this one at least. Yeah, this is one that I would like to say it wasn't released. It escaped. <laughs> That's he. He just needed those extra few minutes on the album. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You're gonna pad seven minutes with this. Yeah, I mean the last song is seven minutes too. Bleed out or or close to it. Hold on. Yeah, seven seven minutes nine seconds. And the thing is, like, you know, to hit quickly on Bleed Out, it's a great album closer because it's Mm -hmm. literally the guy bleeding out on the ground and dying. You can't get a much more definitive end to an album than a character dying. Right. So, again, there's, like, great. It's bookended well. It's it's mostly great. But I think Hostages represents the the major failings of the album that keep it from, like you said earlier, being truly great. Yeah. And I think it, I think it was a good pick because it kind of represents the other duds. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like it's a good one, a good little catch-all for the criticism that we had of the criticisms that we had. It was a good way to to put those forward because the other songs that we picked, I feel like we're all bangers. Yeah, I would say so. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and put my stamp on this one. I'm gonna say stream it, um, especially if you've never listened to the Mountain Goats before. But if you like REM you like Wilco, you know, you like any of those kind of like big name indie bands, you're going to probably find some stuff you like, at least with this album. The rest of Mountain Goats, I don't know, but this album for sure. And that's the thing is, if you like, there's no bad jumping in point for the Mountain Goats. You can pretty much go post to post in first release to most recent one. And Mm -hmm. you'll find it's pretty recognizable. There aren't massive paradigm shifts in sound, even like going electric in this one wasn't like a huge sea change for the mountain goats and yeah. the sound. So there's no real bad jumping in point. Part of me was like, eh, I'll offer a qualified stream it and say that if you're already on board, listen to this. And if you're not, you might not get anything out of it, but mm-hmm. I changed my mind on that. I think this is as good a place to jump in as any. I think their mountain goats have a lot of material and yes. a lot of it's worth your time. Um, you know, check in every now and then. So go ahead and stream it and start with uh, Bleed Out. Yes. And I think before we end the episode here, we would be remiss not to continue to thank folks for joining us on the YouTube page. So if you are there, if you're listening to this right now on the YouTube, thank you. Make sure you're subscribed. Um, If you haven't listened to this or gone and seen the rest of our stuff on YouTube, we've got a ton of stuff on there and things are really starting to cook. Is there anything you wanted to mention about the YouTube, Alex? Well, I think we owe a big debt of gratitude to our friends down under. We want to thank all of our uh, growing roster of Australian fans. We appreciate you guys. You almost doubled our subscriber count in like two or three weeks. Yes. Pretty good. Pretty good, you guys. Let's see if we can keep the momentum up. And if you want to make like an Australian and you want to join the revolution... If you want to get on board, these people know they can tell the next big thing when they see it. Okay, so if you want to get on board, if you want to be one of the cool cats out there, not just a cool kitten, you're a cool cat, full Carol Baskin. What you need to do (laughs) is go to YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash out on that line. Hit subscribe. Hit the bell so you get notifications. Join us today. You won't regret it. You will not regret it. And that's an out on that line guarantee. Bam. Yes. You can also get us on Instagram, Twitter, all your usual social media places. But the main place to do it is the YouTube. Make sure you comment. Let us know what you want to hear. Not only for the reaction videos, maybe singles videos, you know, those deep dive videos we do sometimes, but also for the regular podcast show. If there's a whole album that you think we got to cover, let us know. We're always open for suggestions there. Um, And do you have any final thoughts Alex I just want to wish everyone a great week you know until we see you again have a great time be excellent to each other be good to each other